Okay. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, you know all the architectures that you actually are exposed to, and you might have gone to so many sessions and might have seen a lot of things that are changing, right? So you may be wondering, is there somebody looking at uh, the performance and scalability and hardening of all these different frameworks? That's the first thing. But also you may be wondering, oh, I'm seeing all these things are actually talking to each other. They're getting integrated. Somebody's looking at you know, these things working together, whether they can scale. That is exactly what I'm going to talk about today. Um, luckily, you know, we have uh, folks looking at exactly uh, you know, how these frameworks are actually working together right from the architecture point of view. Right? Because uh, most of the time, when you look at as an end user, right, from multiple industries, because you need to really run your business. So, like, for instance, some of the things like you have, um, if you have a healthcare provider, you are using Cloud Foundry. And, uh, you know, some of the healthcare providers that, uh, you know, I work with, you know, they have this, uh, the consumer solutions rolled out to almost 11 million customers. And uh, they expect a certain performance and scalability. And same is the case with banking, airlines, car rental, consumer appliances. Um, so all of these industry customers, when they look at um, all the architectures that are changing, and it's cool that you know, you're getting new things, but um, how um, the performance and how things are actually getting hardened so that I can go to production. Right? That's exactly. So I'm going to share, uh, um, because when, when you look at all these open source frameworks, um, these are all individual communities, right? You know, you, if you look at um, you know, Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, Istio, Containerd, these are all our individual communities um, working on actually, you know, getting the, the, these frameworks out, right? So, but what is happening is there is like, all these things are actually merging now, or at least some points where there is an integration between the two. So all of you might have uh, seen Irene, for instance. Right? Irene is, uh, you know, you're actually having CF and Kubernetes working together. And then some of you might have seen a um, project where the routing components of Cloud Foundry are actually getting replaced with Istio. Because Istio is going to actually give you uh, more qualities of service um, so we would like to absorb that and actually exploit that, right? So when you look at all of those things, right? Um, so one specific thing um, that I'm going to talk about today is the integration part. Right? So there are three aspects today we're going to get. The first one is the current architecture itself, because most of your applications and systems are running on the current Cloud Foundry architecture, because Irene is actually coming but you have some things already in production. So I'll start with that. Um, what are the things that we look at um, from a performance and scalability point of view on, on this? Mainly, I'm going to talk about the platform today, because when you talk about performance and scale, um, you have an application point of view and a platform point of view. Today, we'll be spending more time on the platform uh, point of view. Then we will get into the new Cloud Foundry architectures, whether it is Irene or the Istio integration with Cloud Foundry. And <clears throat> lastly, we're going to talk about observability. Because as you can see, there are multiple components, multiple frameworks working in tandem, having the observability of your transaction, how you can actually effectively trace your transactions through all these different um, frameworks and then correlate those transactions together. So you need to have a, a kind of an integrated dashboard that will make the operator's life uh, much easier, right? So I'm going to give some of my point of view on that. And um, you, know, you can actually look at what is there right now and um, where we would like to get. Again, my name is Surya Dugrala. I'm from IBM. Um, luckily for me, I'm fortunate to work very closely with all the three major open communities. I'm the co-chair for Istio, one of the performance and scalability work group, uh, jointly with Mandar uh, from Google. 
And I'm also actually working on the Cloud Foundry, and I'm also looking at the Kubernetes scheduler. We'll actually get to some of the work that we are doing in our research lab, which we will be open sourcing it um, soon. So when we talk about hardening, hardening a Cloud Foundry platform, um, I consider that actually I'll start from like four different aspects. The first one is the containers, because everything is container. It is uh, um, the garden container, or because as you might have seen in the previous talk, uh, everybody is actually going towards container D. If you look at um, Kubernetes 1. I think 13 or 11, afterwards the containers are actually container D, right? So when you are standardizing on containers, uh, you have to look at how many containers actually you can pack. The container density is very important. Um, because if you have a node, um, let's say you have a cell, basically, in, in Cloud Foundry, or a node in Kubernetes. So how many parts you can actually pack in a node, and how many um, garden containers you can pack in a cell, that's important. So we should look at, there are certain things that you need to look at. Um, for instance, you have a VM that's using para-virtualized as the virtualization technology versus HVM, which is the hardware um, you know, virtualized, you can clearly see a significant difference. Um, if, because we did that uh, initially when we moved to Diego, we were using PV as the virtualized technology. And for a 4V CPU, 32 GB cell, you could pack only like 30 containers. Then your container is saturated. When we switch that from PV to HVM, all of a sudden, that's the only technology we changed. All of a sudden, you could see you can go 7x. You can go up to like 200 garden containers uh, to saturate that cell. So having that level of um, you know, virtualization technology, how it impacts, is important. Uh, as a cloud provider, you should be looking into those. Then the front door network hops, right? As you develop your Cloud Foundry uh, platform, um, because all the stuff that stands actually in between your client, like a browser or something, to the go router. Because go router, go router, that's when the actual Cloud Foundry boundary starts. So you have some multiple components, like you may have a data power, you may have a proxy other server for security and you know other purposes, right? So how the, the networking layer in the front door, um, how many hops you have, to get to the actual application residing either in the container, uh, garden, uh, the garden container, or um, now it is Kubernetes, that's important. So I'll show some data um, how, how it's really important. Then cell size considerations, because uh, you may have a four vCPU cells or eight vCPU cells. Finding the right cell size is really important because sometimes what happens is like, let's say you are pushing your application, you're staging an application, um, you will see that some of the, uh, you know, c sudden CPU spikes that you may see. Um, they're all like kind of, uh, you have to really consider for your use case, I think what platform, uh, what kind of, uh, what size of the cell is really important. And then you also have, apart from the Cloud Foundry, you have many support services. Like you may have a vulnerability manager that will be scanning for uh, you know vulnerabilities um, within the system, or you may have um, you know some few other network things that you have actually running inside. They all add to the CPU, and you know you need to really uh, look into those things also because um, when you look at all these uh, adding it together, um, so even in idle condition you may be using almost like 20, 30 percent of your um, capacity. So you need to really look at, uh, as, a, as a Cloud Foundry platform um, operator or provider, you should be looking into all those four. So these are some of the things from a um, current, you can actually um, consider it from a current one, also from future architectures also, these things are equally valid. These are some of the potential performance issues that we came across. So if you are running microservices, you know about long tail latency, right? Long tail latency is, a, um, is really bad for microservices um, because that can actually Im impact your scalability, right? 
So that is one thing that uh, we have seen. And then staging failures. When you're pushing something, you know, staging failures are uh, often a common thing um, if you are actually not taking care of some of those things that we have mentioned. And then the BFF, like uh, backends for front-end, that's a more popular uh, microservices architecture. So you have, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, um, the question is about long tail latency. So long tail latency is, let's say you have um, 90th percentile, a median percentile latency, and then you have 99th percentile. So the difference between a median or average latency to the 99th percentile is the long tail latency, because sometimes your average latency may be like 10 milliseconds or something, and long tail latency is like 2,000. So that will be uh, bad for microservices, because one small service can actually take your whole application for ransom. Right? And then BFF, uh, backend for front-end scalability, and then the service integration, because all your applications are actually using multiple services. So how the integration service, um, the services integrated to your applications, you know, how are they actually performing? That is, uh, the integration service is also, um, service integration is also important. So what we did um, so far is actually we have like four of these things that we came up with uh, different optimizations uh, to address each of those um, things. Uh, the first one is go out or keep alive to uh, reduce the long tail latencies. Uh, we introduced uh, the uh, go router uh, keep alive in the upstream uh, keep alive for the go routers. And then we have redesigned the the build pack mechanism such a way that um, you know you don't have um, the um, the CPU spikes because you're gone to a layered file system rather than a flat file system. So that is a OCA build pack um, that has actually solved those CPU spikes and uh, you know that helped us um, you know avoid those staging failures in a, in a congested cell. And then the BFF latency issues that container to container networking that eliminated many of the, the network hops by exploiting container to container networking. And then some of the, the schedulers, like some of the runtimes that you may use, like some of the middleware, right? Um, they may have some schedulers that will impact um, if you have a backend uh, service that you're accessing. And these schedulers sometimes are impacted. They may not be agile enough if the backend service latency is significantly high. Like as an example, if you have a mainframe that you're actually talking to from your application, a typical mainframe latency should be around 100 to 200 milliseconds, but let's say if you have 800 milliseconds or more than a, a second, then that will impact uh, the, the runtime um, algorithms. So these are like a, a typical you know, things that you can use in existing um, architectures, or you may have the same thing you will face in the new architectures also. But the new architectures will bring more um, issues and which need, uh, needs to be looked into. Like for instance, like these are the three, right? We are actually CFCR because now we are containerizing the uh, the actual Cloud Foundry um, uh, runtime environment itself, right? The, the, like we have uh, CFI from IBM and we have um, uh, with, the, with the Bosch can transition from uh, Pivotal. So we have uh, the, the CFCR is actually bringing um, Kubernetes at the, the container level. And then, of course, all the CFAR, the, the Irene stuff that you all are familiar with now, that is actually bringing uh, the Kubernetes at the application scheduler level. And then, of course, the, the Istio, that's the third part, right? So CFCR, one of the aspects that uh, IBM's product for, the, for that um, is the, um, the Cloud Foundry running on Kubernetes is our CFE, like uh, Cloud Foundry Enterprise Environment. So what we have seen with that um, is there is significant optimization on the front end, on the, on the front door, um, that has given us uh, from the, the previous architecture to the CFE. Um, we have reduced enough uh, the front end layers that you know, we can clearly see the improvement uh, on scalability um, in, the, in, this, in this new architecture. 
And from an irony project uh, point of view, I think there are, um, we need to now, we actually were getting into like changing the Diego scheduler to the, um, to the Kubernetes scheduler. So when you go to Kubernetes, then you have few things that you need to really take, in, uh, take a, a look. Um, for instance, now you are getting into Kubernetes centric, um, how the algorithms like, because if you look at Diego, you have certain CPU sharing algorithms. That's how you, how the platform or the scheduler provides resources to your applications. In Kubernetes, um, it's a different way you do. Like these are the things like uh, when you define the requests and the limits for your application parts. If there are, these are the three different uh, qualities of service. Um, the guaranteed qualities of service, if you specify the requests and limits exactly the same. And then uh, if you want to keep requests smaller and then you know, increase, okay, you can actually burst into uh, the limits, then there's a burstable quality of service. And then if you don't specify anything, it is the best effort basis, right? Um, so when you look at the priority from a, a platform perspective, uh, you can see the top priority will be given to the, the, the first one, that uh, guaranteed qualities of service. So all these things now you need to actually take into uh, account because sometimes you may have, um, you may have to uh, look into how your application is actually managing um, the resources that you have. And then again, memory is the, uh, is the scarce resource here, right? You know, we need to understand um, how the total memory or RSS is actually calculated. Right, and you have the, uh, because Kubernetes, one good thing is um, it doesn't uh, use any kind of, um, compared to Docker, right? Um, it, it, it has, um, uh, there is no page, paging stuff, page cache is not there. Um, so otherwise in, in Docker, normally you allocate some page cache and that will add to the overall memory. So these things actually you need to consider if you have Java workloads, for instance, native heap and um, you know, non-heap. Uh, areas and they're all adding up to become that RSS, right? And another major thing that you need to really look at uh, when it comes to Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes comes with a default scheduler. A default scheduler of Kubernetes, in my opinion, actually it needs some work because it cannot identify a, a cluster that is not balanced. Because let's say, Default scheduler schedules your parts in, a, in, a, in a multiple nodes in your cluster. Let's say one node is saturated, and then other nodes you have resources. But the default scheduler, it takes into consideration only the static request that you specify as an end customer, but it doesn't really look at how those resources are used at the node level. It doesn't take into consideration any dynamic uh, node level um, resource usage. That's really not good because you know you can't um, you know have a, a balanced cluster, and then your application may have a bottleneck. Right? Um, so in fact, I brought this up uh, in one of the uh, KubeCon um, last year, and I think we wanted to have a, um, a rescheduler, but I think there is community is trying to get a descheduler. Um, but now, um, even that is actually not giving us enough for this. So what we did um, is we came up with a, a safe or so smart scheduler. Um, this algorithm, what it does is it takes into consideration the dynamic CPU and memory usage on the, at the node level, and then feeds that back into the default scheduler. So it is an extender to the default scheduler. And um, that will now default scheduler uh, can not only uh, take the the resource uh, how much the, the the nodes are actually consuming from a CPU or memory perspective, um, in addition to the the static requests and uh, limits that you have. Right? Um, you can it has a support for overcome it as well. So uh, we have this working, um, but we are planning to actually open source it. Um, so it will be, uh, uh, you know, um, useful for everybody. So another thing that we have um, is the uh, service, Istio Service Mesh that we are talking about. So Istio Service Mesh, um, it gives like four major qualities of service, like connectivity, uh, security, control, and observability. 
So because all these qualities of service are essential for any microservice, um, instead of Cloud Foundry developing all these things from scratch, right? You know, we are trying to um, bring those things by adopting Istio. But then, um, how are we adopting that Istio, right? So we we have a plan to have like in four different areas that we can exploit um, Istio. Like the first one, north south traffic. Um, that's where you know you have an edge server where the traffic goes through Go router. So the plan is uh, to replace that Go router and then use Istio's Envoy um, proxy. And um, and then you have um, you know Cloud Foundry will uh, develop um, a copilot. And some of you might have seen uh, at the main, main tent, uh, that's the weighted routing and all that stuff. That's actually a, a feature that you got from Istio. So there we have some, from a performance point of view, because you have a copilot um, that gets the data from the cloud API uh, and also the Diego components. Um, and then it needs to keep some state there and then then you have an adapter for Cloud Foundry that's developed and that's part of uh, integrated as part of the pilot, which is uh, an Istio component. So the scalability of Istio uh, pilot is important for us to manage the thousands of routes within the Cloud Foundry, which we are used to now. Right? Um, that's one touch point. And then the second thing, because now the the uh, Envoy is actually is is used for a proxy as well as the sidecar. So you need to make sure that Envoy is actually uh, designed and um, you know, uh, scaling for us. Um, so those are the two main things that we are working from um, Istio community point of view. Uh, I'll show you some of the things that we have worked on in recent 1.1. Uh, and then we have the other security stuff and then east-west traffic, that's where the sidecar, um, which is the proxy that we attach to each and every service, um, there also we have to you know, look into. So these are um, some of the, the main things that we have worked on. Actually, the, the slides are available. Um, you can actually go look at all these things. We have opened many of the GitHub issues to, to address um, and add some uh, new features. Like, for instance, uh, now we introduced a namespace filtering in, um, as part of the pilot scalability, uh, which is uh, useful for uh, the Cloud Foundry scalability. And then we have uh, externalized uh, some of uh, the configuration parameters in Istio, like for instance, um, uh, Envoy's, um, you know, because by default Envoy, when it launches, right, it will launch multiple worker threads. The worker threads um, used to be like um, almost equal to the number of worker, th uh, number of hardware threads that you have in the host. So let's say, think about you have a 64 core um, cell or something. So now you're talking about almost 128 um, worker threads spawned per um, Envoy. Let's say you have so many Envoy um, sidecars, then you're quickly talking about thousands of worker threads. Each one takes more memory, right? And you'll have a context switching also. So we externalized uh, a parameter called concurrency. Um, actually, I'm gonna go over these are some of the tuning parameters that we introduced in Istio 1.1 um, that will enable um, you know, the, the Istio integration uh, with Cloud Foundry and uh, able to uh, tune the, the pieces that touch in our Istio integration with Cloud Foundry. And uh, we did uh, get a lot of these optimizations in, in Istio 1.1. Um, but we have a laundry list of things that we have still in post uh, version 1.1. I think we are targeting them for Istio 1.2. So as you can see now, um, as we have the requirement from Cloud Foundry, like scalability from the Cloud Foundry, um, you know, number of routes that uh, you can actually scale to, um, and the Istio, because of this integration from the community's perspective, we're able to get the requirements from Cloud Foundry and able to um, change the, uh, um, the Istio um, design itself, right? That's a very good, uh, you know, working together as a partner there. And then we also have like a proxy sidecar, you know, some of the things that we are trying to do is, let's say you have um, a proxy sidecar and a service. So the, the traffic has to go through the kernel, 
right? So if you have to go through that kernel, then you have to spend some bandwidth, um, that network bandwidth, and uh, so that is actually adding to the latency. So what we are trying to do now is can we avoid going to that kernel and then just go use the user space because they both work in the same uh, space there, right? So those are some of the architecture level um, optimizations actually we are working towards so that um, it's not only useful and scalable for Istio, but also you have uh, the scalability um, for the massive uh, uh, routes that you need to support for Cloud Foundry. So when you put all these things together, right, so we need to look at observability, right, because now you need to monitor the Cloud Foundry, you need to monitor applications, you need to monitor um, uh, the, the Kubernetes layer, and then now Istio. So you, you are looking at multiple frameworks. All, of course, your application doesn't care because it is the application that you're deploying in your Cloud Foundry, but end of the day, if you have an issue, uh, you need to look into all of these things. Like from application-centric monitoring, you need to look into the APM tools, and then that's, that's where you correlate the transactions. And then the runtime-centric, like for instance, you have uh, the different build packs. Um, you need to look into how, what's happening in the build packs, like whether you have any scalability issue, you have what bottlenecks do you have. And then you have to, you come one level down to the Cloud Foundry itself, right? And then you have the one layer down on the Kubernetes orchestrator. Right? Um, and then, of course, the Istio service mesh. Right? So now you can see each one of them, like I'll show you, each one has its own dashboard. Um, if you look at this, um, this is our Cloud Foundry Enterprise Environment. You know, you, it has its own, it gathers data from a Prometheus and then puts them in a Grafana dashboard. And then you can see from a CFE control plane and data plane level, you can clearly see that uh, data points there but it will give you only at that level. And then, of course, it has um, some data points from the underlying cube layer also, it will give you. But if you look at, um, from a performance point of view, right, and we, we created another Grafana dashboard to add additional things like uh, node level, um, or IO-centric uh, data, or pod level data, or the container level data, right? You know, this is, these are like, again, Grafana dashboards. But if you look at the cube itself, um, you have multiple services. Like, for instance, Sysdig is one of the monitoring tools that, you know, most of the, um, the in, in IKS, we use it as a, as a monitoring solution. So that gives a separate view, and of course, it, you can drill down and get the data, right? So now you have data that is coming from the Cloud Foundry dashboard, and some of the data actually coming from the Sysdig, and there may be some overlap there, right? And then think about Istio. In Istio, what we did, uh, we created an integrated dashboard where you have uh, one graph. Again, Prometheus is used, uh, different adapters. Uh, you have um, you know, dashboard for a pilot, a mixer, individual basic components. And then Istio has its own animation also, like you know, we have a Kiali and a Visceral. So it's like kind of you have, like as an end customer, you will be overwhelmed because you have multiple dashboards to take a look at, right? So this is one area we are actually trying to see if we can have just one dashboard that plugs into, so you have a one master dashboard that has the visibility of all the pieces when you deploy your application. So these are the things that actually we are looking because this has a direct impact on um, you know, looking at the performance or uh, you know, scalability of your applications. So there are some references here. Um, you can actually take a look at uh, some of the new features that we have uh, in CFE and uh, how the, uh, the integration with um, Istio is happening. Um, so again, just one one thought um, that I just want to pass it on before we end this call. I think there are many, many um, new architectures and new features that are actually coming as part of this integrated Cloud Foundry um, platform. 
Um, but we, from the open community perspective, uh, there are multiple work groups actually that are working together. Um, like, for instance, Istio, uh, the one that I'm running, some of the engineering interlocks, you know, Cloud Foundry folks are here and there, and then Istio teams. So it's actually we are getting the data requirements from the Cloud Foundry, and that's enhancing Istio framework itself. And then Istio new features, new architectures that we are getting, and then Cloud Foundry teams are actually trying to exploit it. And then from a cube perspective, as I mentioned, um, you know, we came up with this new um, you know, uh, scheduler, right? So that scheduler uh, can be exploited in this new Irene later, right? So as you can see, all these things are actually working together. We have a lot of work to do. But end of the day, um, having an integrated one single dashboard, observability dashboard, um, that will really make life easier for everybody. People are actually thinking in that direction too. I think we are right on time. So any questions? Okay, thank you.